afternoon, everyone. All right, I am going to start today by telling you a little bit about myself. I am a bio nerd and an emergency medicine enthusiast at heart. But above all, I have been in love with public health since my very first high school science fair project. This is actually me at the Virginia State Science Fair back in 2010, where I was researching the connection between playing a musical instrument and asthma. And I was so in awe at how I could take biology and statistics and make it relatable and impactful. And so when I was in my senior year of college and I had to come up with an undergraduate thesis, I knew immediately what it would be on, and that's public health. And while I was on that journey, I uh, discovered something critical, and that is that Disease is racist. Disease takes the path of least resistance. So imagine with me for a moment that you have whoop, just gotten home from a long day at work or a long day of classes and you have two options in front of you. You can A, work out, or B, crash face first into your couch. So if you're anything like me, you're gonna choose the option that involves curling up with your cats in front of Netflix. Disease works very much in the same way. It's gonna take the path of least resistance, and that is to take the easiest victim. So here I was in my senior year of college. Uh, I was studying microbiology, volunteering full time, and attempting to balance being an athlete as well. And I, on top of all of that, needed to find both a research project and an undergraduate thesis, and maybe sleep, maybe. Um, and so, I decided to take the path of least resistance and combine my interest in public health with my uh, research that I was working on at the time along with my other assignments in school. At that time, I was working in a lab studying uh, the effects of a number of uh, disinfectants on Staphylococcus aureus, which is a very, very common hospital acquired infection. So I decided to use this basis for my thesis and kind of roll it all into one. Every year, more than 100,000 people will die from a hospital-acquired infection. That is more than will die in a year from Alzheimer's, or from diabetes, or from even the flu. If every single person in this audience today were to spend a night in a hospital, chances are 24 of you would end up with a secondary infection. Three of you would likely die from that infection. So, every time we go to see a doctor, we go to see them with the anticipation that we're gonna get better, right? We don't go into a hospital knowing that we might die from a, uh, an infection that we get in that hospital ward. So I decided to use this project to find a solution to this problem, to battle this horrible issue. So I randomly selected 20 hospitals from a Medicare and Medicaid database and ran an analysis on community attributes. I wanted to see if hospital acquired infections had an impact outside of the hospital. So I looked at community attributes that included income level, education, supplemental nutrition, veteran status, and race. And what I found was particularly interesting, hospitals with higher infection rates trended towards communities that had high minority populations and very low median income. For whatever reason, minorities were much more likely to get a hospital-acquired infection. But just because there's a correlation doesn't mean there's a causation, right? For example, we have seen a correlation between uh, per capita sales of margarine and divorce rates in Maine. This doesn't mean that because you buy more butter, you're less likely to get divorced in Maine, right? In epidemiology, we there we go. In epidemiology, we use what's called the Bradford Hill Criteria. It's a set of nine loose guidelines that help us determine if a relationship is real or fake. It was deter uh, determined by this man, Bradford Hill, in 1965 to determine the cause between uh, smoking cigarettes and lung cancer. So I had this very, very interesting results, and I wasn't quite sure what to do with it. I went back to the basics of epidemiology. I dug through literature research, I spoke with medical professionals, and slowly I began to put the pieces together. And I was checking items off of this causation list 
in the end, more than half of the criteria were a match. But I had spent weeks working in hospitals, and in fact years if you count my emergency medicine experience, and never once had I gotten a hospital acquired infection. So I needed to know why specific people and why specific communities were much higher risk for these infections. I ended up with a list of three criteria, and that is the inability to develop acquired immunity, presence of secondary conditions, and lack of resources. How many of you here today traveled to get here? Anybody? Yeah? All right. So I did too. I actually came in from St. Louis. It took me two airplanes to get here. And I actually have been traveling quite a bit for work lately. So I've been on 10 airplanes and in seven airports in the past two weeks. And for me, I hate traveling. There's never enough room. There's a baby screaming two seats over, a kid kicking you in the back, and your neighbor is inevitably breathing down your neck. It's just, it's such a hassle. But I am privileged. I had the opportunity to travel, to expose myself to a number of environmental factors, including bacteria and viruses, that in the end boosted my immune system. And this is what we call acquired immunity. Acquired immunity is not something you're born with. You develop it over a lifetime through exposure to the environment around you. Every time that your body has to fight an infection to mount an immune defense, your body and your immune system get stronger. So if you don't travel, if you don't move, if you don't have those experiences, you never build that immunity. Vaccines play into this as well. And as the research has shown, minority groups and low-income families are much less likely to have received the flu vaccine, HPV, pneumococcal, or shingles or tetanus vaccinations, each of which, which will boost your overall immunity. This is then compounded when families will live in one city block for an entire lifetime, for generations on generations, never getting exposure to new environmental factors. <coughs> Secondary conditions also play a part. As I was speaking to one nurse, she explained to me that the patients that they see with the most hospital-acquired infections are those being treated with chemotherapy or dialysis. As a matter of fact, Hispanics and African Americans are significantly more likely to experience cancer or diabetes that would need to be treated with these methods. Now, not just hospital-acquired infections, but many diseases will continue to disproportionately affect underserved and underprivileged communities. This pattern is a type of social injustice that we refer to as structural violence. Structural violence is a systematic way in which social structures harm and disadvantage particular communities and particular populations. It is very, very subtle, almost invisible even, and it has multiple responsible parties. And this brings me to my final point, that communities lack the resources to improve their health outcomes. Now, I am a happy, healthy person. Most of you in this audience are, but we are not a healthy community. And unhealthy communities lack economic opportunities, access to adequate health care, vaccination programs, and often display a high prevalence of drug use. So minority and low-income communities and neighborhoods continue to be the victim of structural violence. Um, but we, you know, we continue, we try with our medicine to treat these infections, to treat hospital-acquired infections in particular, but it becomes a struggle because antimicrobial resistance is evolving at a rapid pace. And we need to understand that community health requires an effort from all of us, that we are only as strong as our weakest member. So I want you to take for consideration the Hippocratic Oath. The Hippocratic Oath is the vow taken by all new medical school graduates that says, first, do no harm. Where does first do no harm end? Does it end when that patient leaves the exam room? Does it end when they leave the hospital? Diseases are evolving at an increasingly rapid pace. And in order to respond to that, we also need to evolve the way in which we 
implement medicine. If we recognize this pattern, we can then extend that Hippocratic Oath to the community to take it on as an effort from all of us. So why should we care? Why does it matter? Structural violence, in, in its most simplest term, we often think of it as occurring in developing nations. In developing nations, it's far away. It's hard to recognize that we could help or intervene. It's not our home, it's not our town, it's not your neighbor. But if disease is racist, then it's coming for you too. This could very easily be your own town, your own city block that will soon be impacted by health disparities. So then, what's the solution? Is there one? My solution is that we need a healthcare system that fights for community health, uh, that boosts herd immunity, because the more people in a community that are capable of fighting an infection, then the healthier the community is as a whole. We need to push for healthcare that emphasizes public health and values diversity over the monoculture because a diverse community is a healthy one. Thank you.